So um, I'm going to talk about dynamic stress triggering. Um, just to start out by saying that I've seen a number of lines of evidence that convince me that dynamic aftershock triggering um, is at least a contributor to the triggering of aftershock sequences. Um, including but not limited to this uh, observation that sometimes in, um, uh, when you have directivity in an earthquake, you can see that directivity also in the triggered aftershocks. Um, but in this talk today, isn't going to be trying to convince you of dynamic aftershock triggering more, um, accepting that dynamic trigger aftershock triggering occurs, kind of asking this question of the mechanism behind dynamic aftershock triggering. Uh, essentially, does dynamic uh, aftershock triggering work through shear stress loading in the direction of slip of the triggered earthquake, or does it work through some sort of fault weakening mechanism that's not actually dependent on that direction of slip in the direction of the shear stress loading? So the question being then for um, forecasting aftershocks, if we want to make a diagram like this, this is a, a, a diagram um, from Debbie Kilbin and others looking at the, the peak dynamic Coulomb stress change. Um, do we actually need to do this? Do, do we actually need to know uh, what the target faults are, or do we just need to, to map out what the distribution of the maximum uh, dynamic stresses are? So I'm going to address this by looking at the relationship between model dynamic stresses and the aftershock focal mechanisms. And if that shear stress direction in the direction, if that shear stress loading in the direction of slip in the triggered earthquake is actually important, we would expect to see then that many of the aftershocks would be slipping in that direction of the applied shear stress. Um, and if not, we would not necessarily uh, expect to see that. So this should be a fairly simple test to just compare focal mechanisms and the dynamic stresses. So the focal mechanism catalog I'm using is shown here on the left is the yang Haxon and Shear catalog. Uh, I'm looking at four main shocks in Southern California uh, listed here with the, the um, authors that I've taken their time-dependent main shock models. Uh, I've used Fred Pollitz's direct Green's function code to um, compute strain grams, which I then turn into stress grams. And all of this I'm doing at periods of 8 seconds and greater, and I've also low passed to 15, 30, and 60 seconds to try to investigate um, the dependence of that, of that um, long period energy. So to compare, just to see whether the slip direction uh, in the triggered earthquakes is the same as this applied shear stress direction. I'm just going to use a very simple metric of the, the angular difference between those two directions on the fault plane. And then I'm going to be looking at catalogs of earthquakes. So over a catalog, I'm going to be just looking at this average misfit as a metric of how consistent this particular catalog is um, with dynamic stress triggering in the direction of slip in the, in the event. Um, with dynamic stress triggering, it's a little harder to define what the shear stress direction is than it is for um, static stress triggering, because we have this shear stress time history here on this fault plane in, in, um, in gray. Uh, there's a few different things we could choose. We could just cho take the maximum shear stress and, ch and pick the direction of that. Um, that doesn't really take into, the fact, take into account the fact that the dynamic loading is very cyclic in nature. So we may want to um, include also saying uh, that this maximum shear stress direction plus or minus 80 degrees is also our loading direction. Or we wanna, might want to use what I consider to be the dominant shear stress direction. Uh, which tries to take into account this whole um, shear stress time history by just taking this time history as a, as a set of points on the fault plane and just finding the long axis of that whole set of points. So back to this figure again, then I'm going to be looking at over, over a catalog of aftershocks, I'm going to be looking at how consistent is the slip direction of the aftershocks with this um, applied shear stress direction, and really I'm looking for changes between the aftershocks and the pre-shocks. I'm looking for this effect of the dynamic, um, stress cha dynamic stresses on the focal mechanism. So I'm going to look at this change in, a in average misfit, which is the average misfit of the pre-shocks minus the post-shocks. And if this change in average misfit is significantly greater than one, this is applying, implying that there is an, an influence on the slip direction 
from the dynamic stress changes. And I'm going to look at the significance through comparison with the distribution that we would get from a reshuffled catalog, basically just to see what we would expect at random if we just partitioned, just partitioned a catalog with no actual changes in it. So um, what I plotted here for, again, each of these four main shocks, in each of these panels, the x-axis the is this change in angular misfit, and the red line is the change in, in average misfit for uh, the real catalog, and the blue distribution is just for this reshuffling of catalogs. So we're, we, we would see a significant change in this alignment with the dynamic shear loading than if this red line is significantly to the right of this blue distribution. So starting with just, if we're just looking at the direction of the maximum applied shear stress, we see that this actually doesn't work very well, only for the Northridge earthquake does it look like there's an effect. If we consider more the cyclical nature of the triggering and consider either that direc the direction of the maximum stress change or the opposite direction, it maybe gets a little better for both Hector Mine and El Mayor, we see a significant effect, but if we look at this dominant um, shear stressing direction over the whole um, um, shear stress time history on this fault, we see for all four of these main shocks we see a significant effect. And I can do a similar test then looking at different um, uh, low pass uh, frequencies from 8 seconds to, to 30 seconds. And you can see again as we get to longer and longer periods, we get more of an effect for more of these events. So this is implying that this effect is either um, based on these longer periods or we're doing a, just a better job of actually modeling what the stresses are at these longer periods. So taking those diagrams now and sort of turning them on the side, now the, the y-axis is this average misfit, this change in average misfit. The blue area is what we would expect um, at random, and the red is the data. And on uh, the x-axis now is the time after the main shock, so we can look for um, a change in this effect with time. And we do seem to see a decay for some of these main shocks, we do seem to see a decay with time with the largest significance of this consistency between the aftershocks and the dynamic stresses occurring over the first um, six months to year. So um, another way to kind of look at at this problem and try to understand if there's really a correlation between the um, focal mechanisms and the dynamic stresses is to look at how the distribution of focal mechanisms, mechanisms changes between the pre-shocks and the aftershocks. So we can imagine um, looking at our distribution of mechanisms. I've, I've collapsed uh, you know, the three-dimensional strike dip and rake just onto a, a one-dimensional axis here for this cartoon, but we can imagine if we looked as a function of mechanism, we we just looked at, at the probability, which is basically just the normalized frequency of mechanisms with these particular strike dip and rakes. And we might have some uh, distribution like this blue curve prior to the earthquake, and prior to the main shock, and then we would have something like this red curve after the main shock. And so there would be certain mechanisms that would become less probable after the main shock, and there would be certain mechanisms that become more probable. And if triggering is in effect and it's, a, and it's affecting what these mechanisms are, we would expect that these mechanisms that get more probable after the main shock are those that agree pretty well in orientation with the dynamic stress change they, they observe. So they would have very low misfits. So that would be these low points on this curve. And in the same way, the, me the mechanisms that get less probable after the main shock, we would expect to be those that are very inconsistent with the, with the dynamic stress orientation. So we would expect to see then this anti-correlation between the probability of a given mechanism orientation and this misfit um, to the shear stress if there really is an impact of the dynamic stresses on the orientations of the focal mechanisms. And if there's not, we would just expect to see no correlation. <coughs> So this is again looking for these, looking at these four main shocks, and again we're looking for an anti-correlation here. Um, if we block out some of the larger probability changes that I've done here in gray, and we just look at some of the smaller probability changes, we can see that there's something that looks like an anti-correlation, um, uh, most pronounced for the El Mayor main shock, but maybe um, for some of these other main shocks. 
Um, so this, this is another indicator that dynamic stress triggering uh, is having an effect on the mechanisms, but it may not be the largest effect on the mechanisms because there's some very large changes in mechanism probability that are not explained by the dynamic stresses. And what those are actually explained by pretty well are the static stress changes. So this is the same sort of plot for the static stress changes. Again, we're looking for an anti-correlation. And for Landers, Northridge, and Hector Mine, we see a very, very significant um, and very large anti-correlation that extends out to um, some of the very highest changes in the mechanism probability. So while the dynamic stresses are having some impact on these changes in mechanism probability, it looks like the static stress changes are actually having a larger impact. So for the El Mayor earthquake, where we actually saw the largest effect of the dynamic um, stresses, we're actually seeing very little effect of the static stresses. So there may be um, you know, some, some complexity here that we're just beginning to glimpse by looking at four different main shocks. So if we think then that there does appear to be uh, triggering by dynamic shear stress, and it does appear that the loading of the dynamic shear stress in the direction of slip of the triggered earthquakes, um, if we do see this, is it actually going to be helpful for us in forecasting earthquake locations? So the question then is, the rate increases occur then in in locations where the faults that are near failure that are well oriented for failure in the background stress are loaded by these dynamic shear stresses. And sort of the equi equivalent way to ask that question to easily test it is basically to ask, do rate increases incur in locations where the background stress and the dy dynamic stress change have similar orientations? That is, does the dynamic stress give an extra push in the slip direction to these earthquakes that were already um, well loaded for failure in the background stress? And so that's, that's something we can test, again, for these four main shocks. And the x-axis is just the similarity between the background stress and the dynamic stress loading um, averaged over the whole time series. And the red is the location of the aftershocks, and the blue is the location of the pre-shocks. And what we expect to see if, if there's a real change in, in the locations that these earthquakes are occurring, we would expect to see this distribution for the aftershocks offset to the right. We do indeed see that. Um, in particular, for the Northridge and Hector Mine earthquakes, we see a very large percentage, almost 80 percent, of the aftershocks occurring in regions where these, um, these stress tensors show some of the highest similarity over the whole duration um, of, of the stress time series. So we see this for Northridge and Hector Mine. Maybe we see a smaller, um, a smaller indication of this for the Landers and El Mayor. Um, again, it's instructive to compare what we see here for the dynamic stresses with the static stress changes. This is the same sort of plot relative to the static stress changes. And you can see that, um, well, none of these are as, as um, uh, impressive as, as the Northridge earthquake was for the dynamic stresses in seeing a full 80 percent at that highest range. You can see that we can get pretty close to that, um, more than half of these earthquake aftershocks are in some of the regions where we see this highest similarity um, between the stress, um, background stress and the applied shear stress. So, um, and we also see that this signal is kind of more consistent that for all four main shocks we see this signal. So just to conclude, looking at um, comparing the aftershock focal mechanisms with the model dynamic uh, shear stresses, we see that the aftershock mechanisms are more aligned with that direction of shear stress loading from the dynamic stresses than we, sh than we saw for the pre-shock mechanisms, indicating that uh, the dynamic loading in the shear stress re direction really ha is having an impact on the focal mechanisms and on where the aftershocks are occurring. This um, is a more significant effect when we measure the shear stress direction to represent sort of the dominant direction of shear stress over um, you know, multiple cycles of loading rather than just the maximum shear stress. And it also appears more significant at longer periods, um, although here we can't really tell the difference between longer periods being uh, more impactful for triggering and it just being more difficult to model what's going on at higher frequencies. And then the question, could this improve our aftershock forecasts? We do see that in some situations, particularly for Northridge, um, that aftershocks really do preferentially occur where the dynamic stress is more similar to the background stress. Um, but we also see that aftershocks are also prefer preferentially occurring where the static stress 
is uh, more similar to the background. And it seems like this effect for the static stress is maybe more consistent because we see it across all four of these main shocks. And we've also seen some other evidence that the static stress effect on the focal mechanisms can have a larger impact on um, the changes in the distribution of focal mechanisms. So it really seems that probably modeling the static stress is actually going to you know, do more for us in terms of improving our forecasts than modeling the dynamic stress. But the dynamic stress does seem to be part of it, and we might get something out of modeling the dynamic stresses too. So just in conclusion, just uh, let you know that all of this and more is in a paper that just um, came out in JGR. So thanks again for your, for your attention. That was great, Jean. Um, do we have questions for her? Yes. So, so the question was that, that intuitively it makes sense that, there, that the dominant direction over the whole stress loading would be more consistent um, than just looking at the maximum, but you were surprised that the patterns were, the patterns were different in terms of which main shocks had, had you know, sort of what level of significance. And, and the differences in the level of significance. Yeah, I don't, I, I was sort of surprised by that too, and I, I don't have a good answer to that, other than um, I think in, in some cases, I think that maximum shear stress direction is actually pretty well aligned with, with the dominant direction over the whole, um, over the whole waveform, but, but in some cases, it's, it's, it's really different. So um, yeah, I, I don't have a good intuitive, intuitive answer to that, I'm sorry.